your skin doesn't all fall off and then all grow back, right? What up, Hope Biscuits? It's your girl Skitten, back at it again. First and foremost, I hope you guys are doing well. I hope you guys are staying safe and sanitized. I just watched a video where a girl said that a woman is the epitome of something and her friend was like, hey, it's epitome. And she's like, no, 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 I'm pretty sure it's epitome. And her friend's like, no girl, it's epitome. And I would just like to say, I'm feeling the girl who said it was epitome, okay? Because I, could, I could have sworn that the word was epitome for so long in my life. And it's because I learned it by reading, not by like hearing it said. Um, same way with me figuring out that it's segue and not sieg, which is really confusing because vague is not vague, right? It's, it's vague, but segue is not sieg and uh, shriek is not shrike, okay? And there is a word that is shrike, but it's not spelled the same. Anyway, the point is, I support that girl in thinking that it was epitome. And I feel you. I just, I really feel that. I really identified with that. That has nothing to do with what we are here to watch today. Today, we're here to watch Overly Sarcastic Productions. This is history summarized, Rome after the empire. As many of us know, the fall of Rome did not happen in an instant right? Um, and even after the quote unquote fall of the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire was still kind of in existence, just not in the way that it had been, right? It, it, it took a long time. Anyway, I'm really excited to see Blue's breakdown of this entire process. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. When the Western Roman Empire fell in 476 AD, the average citizen could be forgiven for not noticing. Right. The Roman Senate still convened, the new king Odoacer was a Christian like his predecessor, and he ruled over Italy with the full approval of the emperor in Constantinople. <laughs> I'll allow Compared it. with the sacking Rome suffered 21 years earlier at the hands of the Vandals, the arrival of Odoacer, barbarian though he may be, was painless. Any citizen old enough to remember the city at the start of the century could say what monuments were smashed or which provinces had been lost, but even they had only known Rome since it became Christian right. and could never imagine a time when their battered city was the singular master of the world's grandest empire. Right. By 475, Rome's capital, its culture, and its state were already unrecognizable from the time of Constantine, let alone the glory days of Hadrian or Marcus Aurelius three centuries mm -hmm. earlier. So as consequential as it was to depose the last Roman emperor in 476, the fall had already been happening for a while. Right. Yet, as we will learn, there was a long way still to drop. But despite its many, many hardships, the next half millennium also saw Rome renew itself, changing with circumstance to take on a vital role in the new medieval world as the seat of the popes. So, to trace how the city of ruins became a city of cathedrals, Let's do some history. Let's do it! In answering what's essentially the question of how did ancient Rome become medieval Italy, we should start with demographics. This says new peoples came from the north, the idea of Romanness got blurred, and then slowly over centuries the identity shifted, not replaced, but transformed. And that's kind of what I was talking about in the beginning, right? It took a long time for the fall of Rome to happen because what happened it's it's kind of like like the blood being replaced in your body at all times right like in the cells on your body like changing over time like it takes time you know what i mean your skin doesn't all fall off and then all grow back right and so that's really kind of what i was hoping that he would get into so i'm very excited about this Rome become medieval Italy, we should start with demographics okay. because it's around the end of the empire that several new groups began making themselves at home. Right. For your convenience and my sanity, let's start with our boy Odoacer, mm -hmm. who came to Rome with a Germanic army on one side and an entire population of Germanic agriculturalist families on the mm -hmm. other. These were the most recent of several client kingdoms whose people resettled in the empire over the last century, and their unfamiliarity with Latin didn't stop them from fitting in with Roman customs or Christian religion, and they even played ball with the Roman aristocracy. Sure as hell beats a sacking. But while the Eastern Emperor Zeno had given Odoacer tacit approval to take hold of Italy, he then gave the Ostrogothic King Theodoric explicit approval to take it from Odoacer. Oh. So Theodoric beat him in battle and then killed the man during their truce dinner and proceeded to rule Italy and Illyria for the next three decades as Viceroy of the Byzantine Empire. All right. During which time he reinstituted the food dole, paid to host games, restored temples, imperial monuments, and public infrastructure, and even gave the Senate a boost with coins inscribed Senatus Consulto. So it says, lightly 
treasoned his way to power, re-implemented public food programs. Okay, all right, kudos to you, sir. Uh, via grain deal with the Vandal Kingdom. Games! And being nice to the Senate. You know, he, he learned the lesson that others should have learned. Sorry, Caesar. Too soon. Structure and even gave the Senate a boost with coins inscribed Senatus Consulto by the decree of the Senate. Okay. This Goth was more effective and arguably more Roman than most late Roman emperors. Interesting. But also more imperial, as Theodoric pulled some crafty diplomacy to gain direct control of the Visigothic kingdom in Iberia, and also leveraged marriage alliances to make the Burgundian and Vandal kingdoms into his vassal states. This was brief, but damn was it impressive. Theodoric's badassery aside, Italy was once again a singular kingdom, lacking the centralized networks of trade and power that made the empire thrive. The cultural incentives and financial means to indulge in any new public megaworks were long gone, and likewise the population decline of late antiquity cut Rome's residents to a tenth as people increasingly opted for the countryside, but life carried on, empire be damned. Provincial economies depended on a steady flow of imperial cash and easy access to markets across the Mediterranean, plus their social structures were also less sturdy than those in Italy. By contrast, Italians fit right fit right in with the Germanic aristocracy and were used to having all the food resources and customers that they needed right there in the peninsula. Okay. That is until 535 when Theodoric's daughter Queen Amalasintha was killed by Gothic usurpers at the same time the Byzantine Empire was conquering its way up into Italy on the orders of Emperor Justinian. Well, damn. In the ensuing conflict between the new Gothic kings and the incoming Byzantines, the winner was neither, but the undeniable loser Rome. was Rome. To simplify an embarrassingly convoluted back and forth, the Byzantine general Belisarius recaptured Naples through an aqueduct and soon retook Rome itself without a fight. Mm -hmm. Recovering the ancient capital for the emperor in Constantinople was almost as impressive as it was short-lived, because the new new Gothic king came down to lay siege the following year. Rome held strong, but Belisarius was recalled to the east to defend against Persia, during which time plague hit and the peninsula fell right back under Gothic control, this time with a new 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 king <laughs> who plundered everything left in Rome that wasn't bold to the floor. He wanted to burn the whole city and turn it into a pasture, but relented only after Belisarius implored the man not to. On the basis that Rome stood as a monument to the vast possibility of human achievement across generations. Now among all the cities under the sum, Rome is agreed to be the greatest and the most noteworthy, for it has not been created by the ability of one man, nor has it attained such greatness and beauty by a power of short duration, but a multitude of monarchs, many companies of the best men, a great lapse of time, and an extraordinary abundance abundance of wealth have availed to bring together in that city all other things that are in the world and skilled workers besides. Thus, little by little have they built the city such as you behold it, thereby leaving to future generations memorials of the ability of them all, so that insult to these monuments would properly be considered a great crime against the men of all time. Well, okay, would you like to write the valedictorian speech? Profound words and broadly accurate, but also rather generous given the state of the city in the mid 500s. Even before the wars, Rome was a shell of itself, with only tens of thousands of residents living in a city built for a million and a steadily dwindling catalog of intact monuments. Aqueducts ran dry, temples and palaces were stripped bare, residents occupied the ruins of ancient monuments, and centuries without repairs became apparent when buildings large and small toppled from earthquakes, floods, or a particularly stiff breeze. <laughs> and frequent floods by the Tiber covered the city in layers of silt, burying old ruins and turning piles of scavenged rubble into grass-topped hills. Rome's destruction wasn't the work of sack boys alone, but of systemic disrepair. Mm -hmm. It decayed slowly, consistently, over centuries beyond what even the most well-meaning kings could maintain. Until one day in 546, when the Goths had the city forcibly abandoned and Rome was utterly, totally empty. Now I know this looks bad. A little. And it is. Yeah. Because the hollow city flipped between Goths and Byzantines three more times before Belisarius finally held it for good in 552 and helped some Italians resettle. Yet with an astoundingly prompt incursion by the new Germanic Lombards, things continued to get worse for Italy in the 500s. Jesus. But consider, Rome cannot die. <laughs> it is too important and too stubborn for something so trivial as death to claim it for long. Because just as steadily as it had first been built, so too could it be rebuilt. And that began with the church. Now, Christianity had been the new normal for a few centuries, but it was here, as a frontier province of the Byzantine Empire, that the institution of the papacy had free reign to change from a purely religious authority in European Christianity to also become something approximating a monarch for its corner of Byzantine mm -hmm. Italy. With 
With the regional exarch governing all the way over in Ravenna, Rome paid lip service to the emperor through the 5 and 600s as the popes became more confident and capable leaders, leveraging their position as the biggest landowner in Italy to be the de facto governors of the province. This evolved gradually and then all at once as the Byzantines embroiled themselves in a controversy about religious artwork in the 720s, then the Lombards conquered Ravenna and killed the exarch in 751, but in 756 the Frankish king Pepin donated that territory back to the popes for them to govern directly. Thanks. This special relationship with the Franks developed under Pepin's son Charlemagne, who confirmed papal authority in central Italy and was later crowned by Pope Leo III as Emperor of the Romans in 800 AD. Holy Roman Emperor. Whew. Busy century. So by the turn of the 800s, Rome had grown its religious power over Europe, took direct control over their papal states, and now had an entire empire in their pocket. Yeah. This would remain, despite some growing pains in the coming centuries, the status quo of European geopolitics for the next 1,000 years. Charlemagne's ascension also set the role of Latin in the medieval world. Mm. The language of Rome always had regional variations, and spoken Latin was rarely as formal as oratory or literature, but without an empire there to enforce linguistic consistency, colloquial Latin began evolving into the Romance languages sooner than you might expect. Okay. Latin speakers across Europe were softening consonants and merging vowel sounds even before the fall of the West. It was all still Latin, but it had diverged from the classical model and was already resembling Italian, French, and Spanish. So Charlemagne's big swerve was to dictate that all Latin used in church should fit a standard classic style pronunciation. Got it. But since this new church Latin sounded so different from everyday speech, Europeans began writing their vernacular languages phonetically to distinguish the sounds from Latin. So it's here that Latin fossilized into a uniform standard while allowing these early vernaculars to freely grow and evolve into the Romance languages. And this is the part that gets like really fascinating for me because like linguistics was something that I was always fascinated with once I figured out what it was, right? <laughs> but so that's really interesting to me. This is like, this is the part where I feel like it gets interesting and I know Blue is going to get more into like the actual history, but I'm like, if we could just like stay here and like the history of language, just like a little bit, just like a tiny little, little bit. No? Okay. While the idea of Rome was completely reinventing itself over these centuries, so too was the actual city. This started back in the 3 and 400s with Rome's first purpose-built churches, like St. John in the Lateran, Santa Maria Maggiore, and Old St. Peter's, all classically styled but foregoing the cramped layout of pagan temples to instead emulate the roomier basilica structure used in law courts. Mm -hmm. And soon enough, this would become the standard design for European churches. Basilicas kept popping up through the fall of the West, but the next few centuries were a little thin on construction on account of those Gothic wars and the therein, causing the most concentrated damage the city of Rome had ever right. suffered. So despite the Pope's growing power and influence, this didn't immediately correlate with imperial splendor, as even this first batch of churches was proving very costly to maintain. However, this constraint provided an opportunity, as in 609 AD, the Pope made a brand new church by reconsecrating the old Roman pantheon as St. Mary of the Martyrs. Cheap, effective, and great for preservation. The city's ruins proved to be remarkable. Makes historians cry less of the martyrs cheap, effective, and great for preservation. The city's ruins proved to be remarkably useful through the medieval period, as old buildings could be retrofitted into housing, marble cladding could be plied off and reused in churches, bronze statues could be melted for new metal, and even marble statues could be broken down into lime for mortar. Wow. It's painfully unsentimental, and I try not to think about it too yeah. hard or cry about it, but it was extremely practical. And some old structures, like the Aurelian walls, were still perfectly fit for purpose, persuading some 50,000 Italians to move back into Rome after the Lombard conquest. Finally, true to Belisarius' word, Rome's greatest asset was ancient prestige, because when the Muslim conquests locked the Holy Land out of the Christian pilgrimage circuit, that left Rome as the premier destination for Christian mm -hmm. pilgrims, and that meant business. Money, money, for the average money, pilgrim money. arriving in Rome at the turn of the millennium, they might be surprised to encounter not one city, but seemingly three. The old core among the hills had become largely uninhabited, as the population clustered by the Campus Martius around the Pantheon, while the papal government operated in the latter into the southeast, and pilgrims stayed in the Leonine city up by St. Peter's, which was enclosed by a newly added Leonine wall. Got Despite it. a shrunken stature, Rome was still the largest city in Christian Europe after Constantinople, and centuries of income from tolls, taxes, pilgrim lodgings, souvenirs, gifts from royal Christian patrons, and the occasional bribe all paid for shiny new cathedrals in the city, allowed the popes to renovate some aqueducts and infrastructure, as well as re-implementing the food dole for the city's poor. Pil just, just to be clear, it says here at the bottom, also pilfering the dead. 
Pilgrimage was such big business that even dead visitors could be profitable, as the church confiscated the possessions of pilgrims who died in the city. Jesus! If Rome could no longer collect its payout by imperial right, they were more than happy to become a tourist trap. The reigns of Rome didn't belong exclusively to the papacy, as there were still a dozen big noble families who built personal fortresses in the ruins of the city, but that's a far cry from the thousands of aristocrats in the classical period. Mm -hmm. And this political climate left zero room for Rome's oldest institution, the Senate. the Senate. Justinian tried to save it by lowering the property qualifications to join, but its power, prestige, and headcount steadily eroded over the decades until, on some unknown day, it ended. In the 570s, it was still sending embassies to the east, and they greeted the emperor when he visited in 603, right. but by 628, Pope Honorius had them disbanded and converted the Senate House into a church. He's like, y'all could go, like, y'all are symbolic at best, and now I got Jesus of the Christ here? Yeah, you're done. All the more striking than deposing the child emperor in 476, the most fundamental and persistent institution of the Roman state had died with so little fanfare we don't even know when. With a whimper, Yet not the a ancient bang. aristocratic tradition of causing trouble for the state was alive and well, <laughs> as those powerful families vied for influence over the papacy in the 10th and 11th centuries to wildly chaotic and extraordinarily debauched results. Damn. And that is all I have the PG clearance to okay. say. Finally, Rome's earlier political break with Constantinople was cemented by a religious schism, dividing the Pope's Catholic Church from the Eastern Orthodox Church. Mm. And three decades later, Rome got sacked by the Normans in 1084. You bitches. Uh, after all these centuries, the Gauls returned to sack Rome. <laughs> Nature is here. Poetic. So what on earth have we just witnessed transpire? Frankly, a lot of contradictions. The empire fell, but a version of Roman society existed, endured. Yeah. The city shrank, but it didn't die. Provinces were reconquered by the Byzantines, but became more independent. And still, old ruins were used for new purposes, religious diplomacy created an entire empire, Latin simultaneously took on new life and became immortal, and once again, a millennium of European geopolitics sprung out from Rome. Even Belisarius couldn't have realized just how right he was about the meaning and unending significance of Rome, as these five transformative centuries established its identity not just as an ancient capital, mm -hmm. but as the eternal city. I really like that framing of like Rome as eternal. I really, I really like that. This was absolutely fascinating. As per usual, a perfectly done video by Overly Sarcastic Productions. I've taken several classes on Rome, admittedly, this was like almost a decade ago, um, but I've taken several classes on Rome and it just, it never fails to surprise me, you know, how limited our knowledge truly is because of like all of this transformation and stuff that was happening. Like he said, we don't even know, like when was the last meeting of the Senate? When did they dab each other up and be like, see you on the other side, homie? You know what I mean? But it's also so interesting because those people who were in power, power, right? Cause like the Senate, again, their influence and power was dwindling, but those families that were in power strove to maintain that power in different ways. They had to evolve as the city evolved. And I think that's where you get into like the very, very interesting, like interpersonal and interfamilial um, conflicts. That's that's where you get into the nitty gritty of it, right? Um, Anywho, since I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Don't forget to leave your reaction requests and recommendations down in the comments below. And other than that, peace out, ho biscuits. It's skittin' lit.